It's the great debate. Great debate. Da -na 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 -na. Hi, everybody uh, watching from all over the country or maybe world. I have no idea. Uh, welcome to uh, this event, this free event. Any donation that you made while you were securing your ticket will be divided between the Denver Museum of Nature Sci and Science and Bunk Court Theater Company, but donations after the event are always wonderful and deeply appreciated. Um, both organizations actually happily accept donations any time of the day or night. There's like not a time that you can make us mad with your donation. Four in the morning, we're fine with it. Like that's like totally cool. And um, in the chat, uh, we have uh, Bunt Ports, uh, a link to Bunt Ports donations and hopefully also an, a one will come up for the museum as well. So um, like I said, feel free to use the chat and hello and welcome. And my name is Erin Rollman. Uh, I didn't say that part at the beginning. Um, I will be your host this evening. Uh, welcome to another installment of The Great Debate, Home Edition, AKA The Greater Debate. A collaboration between Buntport Theater and the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. It is debate season, as we all know. We do promise this will be less stressful than any other debate you may be watching these days. If you don't know, uh, Pre-pandemic, the great debate happened at Buntport on the third Tuesday of most months, and we um, pit important topics against each other like kangaroos versus Hot Pockets and Area 51 versus Studio 54. Uh, and since we don't know when we will get back to doing in-person programming like that, we have taken to the internet. Uh, Buntport Theater and the Denver Museum of Nature and Science teamed up about five months ago to debate pi versus pi, which sounds like they were debating the same thing versus the same thing, but you get it. Um, and tonight we've dusted off another old debate from Bumpport's past and our experts will be debating Bigfoot versus the metric system. So that's all very natural and scientific. So that's right up the alleys of our two debaters who are both educators and performers at the museum. And so, you know, welcome to your screens, wherever they are in relation to me, if they're even on the screen at the same time as me, I'm not positive, but welcome to your screens in an epic rematch, Jose and Mitch. Uh, and they are tasked with swaying your opinion tonight, likely using some combination of facts and nonsense. Um, the percentages of those two things are really up to the individual debaters. Um, and someone did ask in the chat, if we were gonna sing the song, uh, because at the theater, there's like a credits video uh, that always plays. And in the online version, absolutely, I will be singing the credits song and Mitch and Jose can dance along to it for entertainment. And here we go. <clears throat> the great debate, the great debate, mind against mind, fist against fist, except no fists, really just minds, it's the great debate. Great debate. Da -na 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 it's the great debate. Beautiful. Beautiful. I mean, really, just like such a stunning way to be welcomed to a show. So, yes, a lot of claps in the, in a lot of yays and yeses. I appreciate all of the support in the chat section. That's very nice. And so really, we're just gonna jump right into this debate. It's serious business. Um, and we know that you all have been wondering for probably most of your lives, uh, which one is better, Bigfoot or the metric system? And so uh, we do have these two experts here. Thank you for liking my tie. I appreciate that. I like your tie. Don't know if you're wearing one, but you know, trying to be polite. Um, so it is, a very, it is a very serious debate tonight. It, um, important is more the right word, important debate. Um, and so we're gonna get right to it. Uh, and so uh, coming in first, uh, debating Team Bigfoot, please welcome Mitch. Hello, hello, thank you for having me. Uh, <clears throat> so first of all, I just wanted to address some uh, myths and misconceptions about Bigfoot. There's a there's a lot of misinformation about there. I just wanted to get down to the cold, hard facts. 
about Bigfoot. Okay, and the first thing is, the plural of Bigfoot is Bigfoots, okay? It is not big feet. Yes, a Bigfoot will have big feet, but a, and a bunch of Bigfoots will have a bunch of big feet, but you can't say that a bunch of big feet have a bunch of big feet, because that's nonsense. Okay, number two, I already messed up. Uh, <clears throat> you say a, I just said a bunch of Bigfoots, and that's not right, because they're not bananas. Um, just like you have a gaggle of geese or a murder of crows, there are proper uh, collective nouns to use when discussing Bigfoots. Um, and there's a couple of accepted ones. Um, you can say a conspiracy of Bigfoots. Um, you can say a bogus of Bigfoots. But the most generally accepted in academic circles um, is a sneaker of Bigfoots because they're sneaky. And also that's where a foot goes. Okay, and then the third one is uh, there's this terrible rumor out there that um, Bigfoot smells bad, okay? And that is, that is not true. Okay, I'll just give you an example. Um, here is a uh, report from WPIC 13 News in Eugene, Oregon, uh, where a woman named Nancy Dixon Newman encountered a Bigfoot, and I'll just share with you her account. I was out in the forest, and all of a sudden I smelled something that smelled like a skunk, and I knew Bigfoot was near. And then I heard the call of the Bigfoot. It sounded like, whoo, whoo. Now, I am not saying that Miss Dixon Newman did not encounter a Bigfoot because there was literally nothing else that could describe what she experienced in the forest that night. But Bigfoot does not smell bad, okay? The forest smells bad around Bigfoot. So maybe Bigfoot got some of the smelly forest on them. Like maybe that night, that particular Bigfoot uh, sat on a skunk who hasn't, they look like cushions. And so that particular Bigfoot maybe smelled a little bit bad, but Bigfoot doesn't smell bad. Um, people forget that we actually have lots and lots of anecdotal evidence uh, that shows that Bigfoot does not smell bad. If you look at all this anecdotal evidence, uh, you see that people have brought their dogs out to look for Bigfoot and dogs have an incredible sense of smell. And I know that because I went to Dogs, a Science Tale, an interactive exhibit about our furry best friends at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science right now. So if these dogs and their incredible noses couldn't find Bigfoot, then, uh, then Bigfoot must have at most a gentle musk, you know, like a, like a fresh pot of tea brewing in a meadow type of thing. But people still say that Bigfoot smells bad. And you know what really gets my goat? El Chupacabra. <laughs> Sorry, just a little, just a little cryptozoology joke there for you. <clears throat> Getting back on track. You can't say that Bigfoot doesn't exist just because we haven't found them, Yeti. <laughs> There's another one, Yeti. Okay. I'm sorry, this is serious and I am taking it seriously. And I don't wanna waste your time. And I'm keeping track of the time that I'm wasting of yours on my Sasquatch. <laughs> okay, that was the last one, that was the last one. <clears throat> okay, so Bigfoot is usually described as being about nine feet tall and weighing about 40 stone. And yes, those are the correct units, Jose. If Jose wasn't muted right now, you'd hear him saying, uh, um, actually you should have said 2.37 meters. But no, I should not have said 2.37 meters. Because if you run into Bigfoot, that's like an emergency situation. Nobody has time to multiply anything by 2.37, okay? And <laughs> You gotta understand right away. If someone's like, look out, it's Bigfoot, he's nine feet tall. You gotta understand right away. And you might be thinking, well, what if you saw this Bigfoot in Luxembourg, right? Luxembourgians use the metric system. Yeah, they do. But you know what else they use? They use thief. <laughs> Every Luxembourgian becomes, becomes pre-installed with up to two Bigfoot approximating devices. Like we talk about people use the metric system everywhere, but that doesn't mean that if you're like, Bigfoot is nine feet tall, they're like, what is a foot? I have no frame of reference for how big a foot might be. That's wild. And sure, my foot isn't exactly 12 inches. Yours might not be either. But still, it's a good approximation of how high in the tree you have to climb so Bigfoot can't get you. So nine feet tall, weighs about 20 stone. Now, some of you may not know that a stone is even a unit of measurement. And those of you who do know, uh, probably off the top of your head can't convert to pounds or metric whatevers. But I'll bet every single one of you knows what a stone is. It's like a rock, but bigger, it's big and heavy. And probably most of you have at some point tried to lift a stone. 
Maybe you were gardening and you wanted your stone to go somewhere else. Maybe you were setting up a stone barricade because there's a bunch of aggressive grasshoppers in your neighborhood. And I know the grasshoppers can be aggressive because I saw Funport Theater presents Grasshoppers, an outdoor socially distanced theater experience this weekend put in Colorado Springs. Or maybe you're moving stones around to build a castle. I don't know what you get up to in your free time, but the point is, you know what a stone is like. You know a stone is big and heavy. And you don't just know, like, oh, I recall reading in a book one time the specifications of a stone. No, you know how that rough stone feels on your fingers. You know how it feels in the strain of your muscles as you try to lift it. You understand a stone with your whole body. So if your friend is like, look out, here comes Bigfoot, he's 20 stone. There's no converting numbers. There's no thinking about uh, how many whatevers that is. You just understand that instantly and you get away from Bigfoot. Now, how would this situation play out with the metric system? Well, I'm glad you asked. Now to discuss that, we've got to go back in time a little bit to the origin of the metric system. It was around the year 1790 in Europe. And a bunch of scientists got together and they had this conference and they said, oh, it's so hard. Measuring stuff is so hard. How come there's 12 of these to one of those and five of those to 27 of those? It's so hard. So they created measuring stuff for dummies, AKA the metric system. Now they needed to establish their units, right? And the kilogram is the basic unit of mass. And uh, what they did is they made a kilogram. They made a little uh, metal, cylinder that was the kilogram. So you can be like, how heavy is a kilogram? And you pick that up. That's exactly that heavy, except you weren't allowed to pick it up. It's not like a stone that everyone has access to. The kilogram was locked in a vault deep underneath the streets of Paris to keep the riffraff away. Now this was fine for whatever, a couple hundred years. But then just a few years ago, someone went to check on that kilogram. They just left it down there in the dungeons. And they found that it weighed slightly less than a kilogram. It weighed about the mass of a single human eyelash less. Single human eyelash less. Now, a, a human eyelash is meaningless. It's absolutely nothing. Except for you guys. You guys are awesome, and I love the work that you're doing. Listen, eyelashes are totally inconsequential. So who cares, right? The scale at Walgreens still knows what a kilogram is. But see, here's the thing, that little metal cylinder, that didn't represent a kilogram, that was the kilogram. So now that that changed, every scale at every Walgreens is wrong. And all of the math everyone's been doing for hundreds of years is wrong. Now everyone's wrong, thanks a lot, metric system. So obviously, this is a science emergency. Those scientists were running around, their lab coats all a flutter, they were spilling beakers full of colorful liquids, tripping over centrifuges and other sciencey paraphernalia. They were like, we gotta make a kilogram mean something that can't possibly change. So this is what they did. And I just like to take a moment here. My colleague Jose will probably tell you that the metric system is great because it's so easy. Like a baby could use it, a, dr a drunk baby could use the metric system. Just keep that in mind while I try to explain to you what a kilogram is. Okay, the first thing you need to know is this. This is a math thing that a fuzzy haired German weirdo came up with. And it means energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. But for our purposes, you just need to know that energy can be defined in terms of mass and vice versa. So that's what they did. They decided to buy, define kilogram in terms of energy. And the simplest derivation uh, looks like this. So you got Planck's constant in there, speed of light, some other things. Everyone got that? Of course you did, it's the metric system. It's so easy, right? So how would our situation in the forest play out with the metric system? You'd be camping, setting up your tent, uh, trying to figure out how to describe where you are to the DoorDash guy so he can bring you your pre-toasted marshmallows or whatever camping is, I don't camp. Um, and then your friend would be like, look out, there's a Bigfoot coming. And you'd be like, oh, how big is it? And they would be like, okay, so you know the mass of a body uh, at rest whose equivalent energy equals the energy of a collection of photons whose frequencies sum to 1.36539248965 times 10 to the 50th hertz? It's like 123 of those. So first of all, who invited that guy camping? 
He sounds really annoying. And second of all, now you've been trampled by Bigfoot. And Bigfoot is a gentle creature. But if you're just going to stand there, blah, 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 well, he's coming on. He's just going to trample you. My point is, people died in this story I made up. So am I saying that the metric system is a murderer? You decide. You decide. But this really gets to the main point I'm trying to make, uh, which is, why words? Wherefore words for? I'll tell you why I words. I use words to, to try and make a connection, you know? I'm just trying to get through this crazy world. And I'm just trying to share some of my experience with other people, you know? And this, the metric system can't do that. Like, okay, the metric system is great. When the inevitable machine uprising comes and we're all enslaved by the computer tyrants of Kolu, great. The metric system is all we'll be allowed to use. It'll be helpful to know it. But until then, if I come to your house, I don't want you to offer me, uh, hey, would you like 13 cubic centimeters of cake? No, no, I wouldn't, because that's not how I eat cake. I had a rough day. I want two angry fistfuls of cake. I want like, you ever seen a cat that's like so big, it's practically a dog? That's what I want, a big, a too big cat of cake. No, like, okay, uh, half the people who RSVP'd to your wedding didn't show up, and now you got all this extra cake, and you can't put it in the fridge, because that's full of the, all the appetizers they didn't eat, so you can't put it in the pantry, so you try to put it in the bathtub, and then you slip, and the cake falls on you. That's how much cake I want. I want to be buried in a tear-soaked bathtub of cake, because I am a human person, and that's how we eat cake. And you know who gets that? Bigfoot gets that. I guarantee you that if you ever get invited to a party at Bigfoot's secret underground lair, you will receive a mythical amount of cake. You will receive an amount of cake that's blurry and very hard to document. You will, if you tell people how much cake you got at Bigfoot's party, they won't believe you and they'll think you're crazy. And that is why you should vote for Bigfoot. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mitch. Wow. Wow. Mitch, I don't even, I have so many things, you know, like I, I feel like flooded with, with stuff. Uh, first of all, I would say that I was very pleasantly surprised that you had a main point, you know, like that was, that was just sort of a joyous thing to find out. And then to have it be that like, you want too big of a cat much of cake. That, that's an excellent main point to have. Uh, I see in the chat, we're getting some claps. People, people are into cake. Um, we can see your chats, even if you can't see each other's chats, so I encourage you to keep chatting. In fact, um, during the course of your chat, uh, I think that I should point out a couple things. Um, uh, Becca did suggest that uh, uh, making, like mocking Einstein is maybe not a crowd-pleasing choice. Your, your choice, but maybe not a crowd pleaser. And uh, Jesse thought maybe the plural of Bigfoot is Big's foot, like attorneys general. So, you know, maybe that's something you'll be able to clear up in, in the rebuttal section. I'm not sure. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, we're being told this is already better than the first presidential debate, which is seriously setting the bar so incredibly low, but we'll take it. We'll take it, right? So uh, you know, let's keep going. Let's uh, let's give Jose a chance uh, to get uh, his main point across for the metric system. Everybody, welcome to your screen, Jose, for the metric system. Hello, everyone. I, Mitch, I have to say that was very well reasoned and very coherent. I followed you completely, every twist and turn. And I have to say, respectfully, that you did an excellent job, and I appreciate it. Uh, I will say, though, that uh, I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to do my best. I want to thank Aaron and everybody else. And if a fly lands on my head, please, somebody let me know. I don't want it to be there for two minutes. That would be really embarrassing. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so let's begin, shall we? Bigfoot versus the metric system. I'm going to start by saying that I think everybody here uh, listening to this debate, arguing in it, hosting it, can agree that science is wonderful. 
science is one of those wonderful tools created by humanity that has really transformed our world, oftentimes for the better. Now, it has some moments where it hasn't been so great, but I mean, think about it. Science has given us modern medicine. Science has allowed us to slip the bonds of Earth and explore the cosmos in ways that our ancestors never would have thought possible. Science has given us wonderful technologies like the ability to converse right now from our, the comfort of our homes during a pandemic, all possible because of science. So I just want to make that point right off the bat that science is awesome. Now, science needs a few things in order to function well. It needs objectivity, objectivity ideally. It needs the good questions, and uh, it also needs good measurements because mathematics is the foundation of all science. Galileo, who is often credited for being the first ever scientist, in his manifesto, a letter that he published arguing with the Jesuit priests about the true nature of comets, said this. So math is awesome, science rules, and you suck. That is a direct quote from Galileo. And I think that quote is really illuminating on the importance of measurement and mathematics in science. Now, all measurements are arbitrary. This has been true since the beginning of time, and many cultures around the world have created their own measurements, whether that be cubits or miles or li or what have you. Now, in the days when everything was made by hand and information was passed from master to apprentice, so on and so forth, it was all right that a cubit could basically be from the end of my arm to my shoulder. My cubit would be different than your cubit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But as humanity transformed and as science became something that influenced more and more people's lives, these sort of uh, non-standard measurements began to be mm, a bit of a problem. For several hundred years, scientists struggled to reconcile each other's work, which is, of course, an important part of science, until the metric system was developed. The metric system is the best, and this is why. The metric system is not based on the arbitrary measurements of the temperature of somebody's armpit or the length of somebody's foot. The metric system is based on universal natural forces. The original meter was created by finding a pendulum that would swing back and forth in one second at the equator. That is how they came up with the length of the meter. Even that complicated science you were talking about uh, to us just a second ago, Mitch, is still based on a natural phenomena that is not dependent on the vanity or whims of any human being. It is a separate natural phenomena that we can use as a measurement system. And to make this measurement system easy, they made everything divisible by 10. And Mitch, you said, oh, if only there were something and you used your feet to help you measure things. Well, if there was only something to help you count by 10s. If only I had something that helped me count by tens. Now, I know there are some silly words in the, in the metric system, like kilo or centi, but really, once you learn those words, you, you know exactly how many things are, are in there. I'll, I'll give you a quick example. There's 100 centimeters in a meter. So if I asked you how many centimeters were in five meters, you'd know the answer was 500. Can you tell me how many inches there are in five yards? Mm. That one's a little tougher. Or if I said, well, how many meters are there in five kilometers? Well, one kilometer is a thousand meters, so you would say there's 5,000 meters. But what if I said, how many yards are there in six miles? But who knows? And the reason is the imperial measurements don't make a lot of sense. So I have one, uh, I have an inch, multiply that by 12, and I have a foot. Multiply a foot by three, and I have a yard. Multiply a yard by 22, and I have a chain, which is an official measurement. Multiply that by 10, and I have a furlong, which I'm sure is a measurement we all use in our daily lives. Multiply that by 8, and we have a mile, and multiply miles by 3, and then we have a lead. That is like, what carries this here? What? <laughs> Talking about complicated math? That's crazy. By the way, it is called the imperial system because a bunch of old white kids decided that everybody in the world should use this system back when the sun never set on the British Empire. Spoiler alert, imperialism hasn't aged very well. Maybe we should look for a different system. Now, temperature is also really confusing in the imperial system because Fahrenheit, very cool guy, 
basically made his scale up by sticking a mercury thermometer in some salty water and calling that zero, and then sticking it under his armpit and deciding that was the temperature of a human body. So when you go outside and say the temperature in Fahrenheit, what you're basically saying is like, oh, it's a sweltering armpit out here. Oh, it feels like a breezy half an armpit today. But using Celsius, of course, freezing is zero and boiling is 100. Most people don't even know the boiling temperature of water in Fahrenheit. Just take two seconds. Did you guess 212 degrees at sea level? Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people already love the metric system. They just don't realize it yet. I mean, it's already so ubiquitous with everything in our lives, particularly if you go to the doctor. I bet if you went to the doctor and told the doctor what was wrong with you, and then the doctor said, well, it sounds like you need some medicine. Nurse, bring me five weeks of a cup of medicine, please. You might feel a little nervous. And then if the doctor was sitting there with the measuring cup going, yeah, it looks about five eighths. All right, open up. You'd be even more nervous. You'd run away from that doctor's office and never go back. But if your doctor says, all right, we're going to give you 30 milliliters of medicine, just sounds good, doesn't it? It just sounds good. And listen, I've personally been enjoying the metric system during the shutdown because I've really been appreciating my 750 milliliter bottles of vodka. So, you know, things to get you through rough times. There's the metric system right there. So the metric system, it's easy to use. It's easy to memorize. Everything's divisible by 10. It's based on natural forces. I've talked about how it is so wonderful. Why don't we use the metric system? That's a legitimate question. Why is the United States the only major industrialized nation in the world that still uses the imperial system, not even a system that we ourselves created. Well, there is a very simple explanation for this, and it is Bigfoot. Bigfoot has been single-handedly leading a conspiracy to prevent the adoption of the metric system in the United States for over 200 years. Now, that may seem radical at first, but I'm going to give you some facts. And I'll let you decide whether or not Bigfoot is really just this gentle, innocent creature that wanders around the Pacific Northwest. Instead of being a nefarious, conspiratorial, selfish monster that is trying to hold the United States back from moving forward with the rest of the world. Fact. In 1793, Thomas Jefferson sent Joseph uh, Dombey to France to retrieve artifacts like meter sticks and those kilogram weights you were just talking about, Mitch, so to bring them back to the United States so that the United States could adopt the metric system. Joseph Dombey's ship was waylaid by pirates and he died in captivity. But what was not widely reported at the time was that the captain of the pirates was a heavily bearded and very friendly man named Captain Big E Foot who took the kilogram and was seen hurling it into the sea saying, never shall they use the metric system in the United States. Next fact, in 1893, the United States Geological Survey, the Mendel Order was adopted and this was quickly spread throughout other branches of the government. This said that for official government surveying purposes, the metric system would be used instead of the imperial system. Two years later, in 1895, the Utah Constitution was written to say that the metric system shall be taught in the public schools of the state. The metric system began to be adopted throughout industry and also throughout public life throughout the United States in the 1890s. But then it went into decline in the early 1900s and 19-teens. What happened? Well, Theodore Roosevelt, avid outdoor enthusiast and proud hunter became president of the United States. Theodore Roosevelt used his position to create a national parks system. The same Theodore Roosevelt who had been seen in the presence of one Bigfoot on multiple occasions. And as people fled to the national parks to enjoy the outdoors, the sightings of Bigfoot in the United States skyrocketed with one sighting from one Mr. Charles Rutherford Plimpton on a visit to Rocky Mountain National Park in 1917 said this, and I quote, thus after we set up our tent to have a nice repose by the fireside and having a nice dinner retired for the evening for some rest, a great disturbance appeared on the outside of our tent where it rattled and shook 
and we heard a most sinister and villainous voice say to us, the metric system is terrible. We were so frightened and feared for our well-being that we will never ever use the metric system under any circumstances. That is direct intimidation of American citizens. My final piece of evidence. In 1968, after the proliferation of the metric system's use in the fields of medicine, science, and industry, the United States Congress created the United States Metric Survey. This survey went throughout all levels of American society to determine if the United States was ready to finally adopt the metric system. And their response to Congress was yes, that this would happen. So in 1975, the United States Congress passed the Metric Conversion Act of 1975. It established the commission to integrate the use of the metric system, first beginning with roads and then throughout other areas of American life, with the goal that the metric system would be completely adopted in the United States by the year 2000. But what began happening on television in the late 1960s and during the 1970s? Suddenly, feel-good PR bookings by Bigfoot skyrocketed on television. Suddenly, Bigfoot was helping solve mysteries alongside Scooby and the gang. Suddenly, Bigfoot was best friends with the six million dollar man. Suddenly, Bigfoot was making feel-good movies with the Hendersons. Uh, he even had a small, non-speaking role in one of the biggest movies of all time, 1977's Star Wars, going by the moniker Chewbacca. What happened after all of this? Bigfoot made inroads with Hollywood insiders, and this led him to one of the most powerful people on the planet in the early 1980s. Former Hollywood star Ronald Reagan had been elected president of the United States, and using his Hollywood contacts, Bigfoot was able to get the Reagan administration to defund the Metric Conversion Act Commission, and after it was defunded, it was eventually disbanded during the Reagan administration, which is why the United States does not use the metric system to this day. Bigfoot has worked for over 200 years to hold American citizens back from using a, a measurement system that is easier to use, that is based on natural forces, and that is used by the rest of the world. Why? Why does Bigfoot do this? Because Bigfoot cannot stomach the fact that once the metric system is adopted, they would have to change their name to big centimeters. This single selfish desire is what has caused so much terror and derision in the United States. Did you know that at one point, while working with international partners, people in the United States designing a spacecraft using the imperial system put their programming into the spacecraft that had been designed using the metric system and the, the spacecraft, which caused, cost millions and millions of dollars, was completely destroyed. That is taxpayer money that was lost, not to mention all of the advancements that could be made, not to mention the fact that the United States slips further and further behind the world in leading in the realms of science, mathematics, engineering, and technology. And who do we have to blame for this? That monster. I say Bigfoot should go back to that corner of the Pacific Northwest where they came from and let the American people decide for themselves if they want to adopt the metric system or not. I rest my case. Wow. Thank you, Jose. So much information there. Oh, my goodness. At first, I was a little bit like, you know, don't talk about my cubit. That's like... I prefer people not talk about my cubit, doesn't make me comfortable. And then it just turned on a dime and all of a sudden we were deep diving into a conspiracy that frankly, like any good conspiracy theory, lots of people in the chat were on board with and lots of people were not. Uh, no, no, big, no big shock there. Uh, I agree with Lindsay that big centimeters is kind of catchy and I think the Bigfoot should sort of like think about that, you know, but like, it's not my business, right? It's not my business. Wow, okay, well, we're just gonna jump right in. Uh, both of our debaters have a, a short time for a rebuttal, and then it's everybody's uh, chance to vote. So uh, here we go, Mitch, uh, come, come on back with your rebuttal. Uh, yes, thank you, Aaron. 
And uh, thank you, Jose, as always, uh, and exceptionally well researched. I'm always amazed at the depths you can get to uh, throughout history. Um, <clears throat> well, so I guess uh, a couple of things. I mean, some of that stuff makes sense. Bigfoot helping establish national parks. That makes sense. One thing that doesn't really make sense is uh, Teddy Roosevelt didn't ever do anything that Teddy Roosevelt didn't want to do. And don't tell me that Teddy Roosevelt was, um, I don't know, intimidated by a big fuzzy creature. Because we've all seen that photo of him riding that photoshopped moose, right? And he had a, uh, a pet badger, a wild badger that would terrorize his help. And he would just chase his help around and Teddy Roosevelt would just laugh and laugh. And that is true, you can look it up. Also, like, all the stuff I say is true, by the way. You don't have to look it up, though, but, like, all of it's true. Um, not just that. <laughs> um, but if I can just uh, take something that you said wildly out of context, um, I just want to remind everyone that Jose said, the metric system is terrible. Um, so, dash Jose Zuniga 2020. Um, that's, uh, I'm going to put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, what else was I going to say? I mean, if, if Bigfoot made national parks, that sounds like if you like nature and parks, think of Bigfoot. If you like parking lots and math homework, think the metric system. Um, and, you know, maybe they, don't, maybe they don't work together. Maybe the metric system has a hard time with Bigfoot, you know? And there's a hard time with Loch Ness Monster and Chupacabra and the, the Fresno Nightcrawler, which have you heard about the Fresno Nightcrawler? The Fresno Nightcrawler, right now in California, people are being terrorized by the ghostly figure of a pair of pants. There is a ghostly pair of pants running around California, and that is the best thing I've ever heard. That fills me with joy. How much joy? Is an amount of joy that you can divide by 10? No. Can you convert it into other units easily? No. Because that's not how joy works. Stop trying to put everything about my life in little boxes, metric system, okay? The thing about Bigfoot is Bigfoot doesn't exist in units of, of grams or centimeters or whatever. Bigfoot exists in units of, of joy and awe and wonder. And you can't put Bigfoot in a box, okay? Especially not a shoe box, because those are only for regular foots. Wow, that is a very strong point you make at the end there, Mitch. Incredible. I, I have to say, absolutely, you're allowed to uh, take uh, any quote wildly out of context because this is, in fact, a debate, and we all know that that's what happens at debates. So absolutely fair game. And everybody, we're going to leave you to uh, look up the ghost pants situation that's happening in California after the debate is over. So we'll just get right back into Jose with his rebuttal. Uh, I, you know, I, I want to say first off, uh, Mitch, I don't think anybody here is disagreeing with it. Nobody is suggesting that Bigfoot is not real. On the contrary, Bigfoot's impact on the United States has been very, very significant. And I also agree that national parks are wonderful things. I go to national parks as often as possible. I love to spend my time in the great outdoors. And I'm glad that they exist, whether or not they were intended to bring joy to people or whether or not they were originally intended to destroy the metric system in the United States doesn't diminish the fact that they are wonderful national treasures. But these national treasures are threatened by the climate crisis, by human encroachment, by wildfires, and we need the metric system as a foundational part of science to understand and confront these challenges. So I, that's what I am, I'm also thankful for the metric system because the metric system will be able to preserve these natural treasures. And I, I would argue that the metric system could easily be applied to the understanding of any cryptid um, as soon as we have Bigfoot in a place where Bigfoot can be measured, I mean, think of what that would do for science. Jane Goodall said it would be interesting if Bigfoot was discovered because then think of the scientific implications of that. Think of the scientific implications of the Loch Ness Monster. To understand these creatures, we would need the metric system supporting the science that we, we would use to understand them. If you happen to get a hold of that pair of pants, then I would definitely say that uh, 
you could, oh, this is my speaker's not working. Is that true? Can you hear me? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll wrap it up quickly then. I, I just have to say that, you know, if you get a hold of that pair of pants, the metric system can help us understand it. And I am proud to say that I live, I'm a proud citizen of the United States, I'm a proud citizen of Denver, and I think we should use the metric system. I would gladly live in the 1.6 kilometer city, 1.6 kilometers high. Yes, yes. Uh, we'll see if we can get, if we can get the tagline for, for Denver changed to that. I mean, it's not, it's not quite as catchy, but I don't know. It's, 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 it may be. So I really think that as you're, as you're all uh, deciding on uh, who you want to vote for, and it really is up to you tonight uh, to tell us uh, wh which one is better. It, I guess it's sort of like, um, are you more interested in the fact that Mitch told you that there are ghost pants or in the fact that Jose, when the ghost pants are found, is going to be able to get some real good data on those pants, you know? So it's really just kind of balancing those things out. Um, it is a difficult choice, Becca, I agree. Um, and so I think, you know, we're gonna get right into the voting. Uh, so there is going to be a poll that pops up on your screen and uh, you, get to, uh, you get to vote now, um, which is very exciting. And voting is important. Let's, let's all take a moment to think about that, that voting tonight is important. Uh, voting in general is so important. Uh, so, you know, make sure that you're registered to vote. If you have any questions about how to do that, uh, I will be happy to answer them. Uh, anybody really, like your neighbor is like chomping at the bit to help you register to vote and uh, you can vote. So uh, that's, I think, enough plugs for, for voting in general. Uh, and so really, I'm gonna just do sort of a countdown and uh, we're going to find out uh, we, oh, someone wants to know if they can vote for big centimeters, and I wish that were on there. I do wish it were on. Um, but uh, we will, um, uh, I'll be counting down and the, the winner will be revealed and we will be able to see the disappointed face on one of these Zoom boxes and the celebratory face in the other, and it's gonna be really exciting. So uh, let's, you can't vote for ghost pants. People really are kind of going for other things right now. We needed a much longer ballot. Basically, like we needed the Denver ballot with like 21 choices, some of which, what? Um, but okay, here we go. Uh, so the winner of the debate, according to all of the people watching, we are going to find out in five, four, three, two, one. Dun, dun, dun. Whoa, that is tight. That is tight. Bigfoot takes it. And there, Bigfoot is celebrating with a, a gif or a gif, depending on however you would like to say that. Uh, it was a close one, though. It was a close one. So Bigfoot took it tonight, everyone, by, by an inch. LOL. Good. Coming in with the jokes. Coming in with the jokes. Excellent. <clears throat> oh, thank you both. Yeah, I did. Can, can I just add a uh, public service announcement? Please do, yes. Sightings of Bigfoot have really gone up uh, recently. And just, you need to be careful that if you see Bigfoot walking down your street, just take a moment and make sure that it's not just your neighbor who hasn't had a haircut since February. Okay. Thank you, is, thank you Mitch. Thank you yeah. for that public Welcome. service announcement. That is good for all of us to keep in mind. Thank you so much to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science for hosting tonight. Uh, you can schedule timed entries at the museum right now. You can go to the museum, which is exciting, but they also have all sorts of uh, upcoming virtual events, like on Thursday, October 29th, there's Date Night Supernatural, so you should look that up on their website. And Wednesday, November 11th, there's a virtual tour of the universe with both Mitch and Jose, I believe, but it is not for your children to come to, okay? So Bunkport right now doesn't have any indoor programming at the moment, but we do some online stuff and um, outdoor distance stuff, including Mitch is correct to have plugged it this weekend. We will in fact be in Colorado Springs performing our outdoor show, The Grasshoppers. Uh, you can uh, get information about that on the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center website, or we have a link on ours if that is more, more easy, more easier. 
terrible. I'm like running out of, I'm running out of words at the end of this. Words, right, Mitch? What is they? So I do recommend that everybody follows both Buntport and uh, the museum on our various social media pages because that is the best way to find out what we're up to. And both organizations are so grateful for your support during this time. If you still want to donate, you can head to our websites. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. And uh, we hope that we have, I see that we're restoring some faith in humanity when it comes to debates. And so that is, is the best thing that we can be doing right now for you all. So stay safe and fight hard and, and be well. Thank you all so much for coming. Bye. Clapping.